you for being here this afternoon, and I appreciate your uh, attendance and your interest in this subject, and certainly appreciate the opportunity to speak with the Attorney General, and uh, honored that he would uh, come here to Buncombe County to hear our experiences, particularly in the opioid crisis. Uh, I'm Jim Holland. I'm with Health and Human Services, and I, along with Dr. Jennifer Mullendore and uh, uh, Hi, Jim. <laughs> Jan Shepard, uh, the Health Division Director uh, for Health and Human Services, coordinate the Safety Net Coalition meeting, and you see our what we do. It's mainly made up of medical providers in the community that serve the under and uninsured, and our focus is how do we make sure that we meet the needs of those um, uh, most times medically fragile population, uh, particularly with the challenges that many of them are uninsured and have uh, many needs other than just their medical needs. And uh, one of the things that we've been focusing on in this safety net has been the opioid crisis and the impact that that's had, uh, not only on the community as a whole, but as safety net coalition members, the impact that it's had on providing treatment and getting people access to treatment, as well as the impact that it's had on first responders in our community. Uh, I'd like to take just a minute before I just go through a couple of uh, slides just to give sort of lay the foundation uh, to just recognize uh, some folks that are here today and if I leave someone out please raise your hand or please tell me point that out to me I'd like to uh, first <coughs> recognize uh, members of uh, Buncombe County Board of Commission uh, Joe Belcher Jasmine Beach Ferrara um, uh, Buncombe County Sheriff Van Duncan we also have the Madison County Sheriff, Buddy Harwood, here with us. And we have the uh, Chief District Court Judge, uh, Honorable Al Calvin Hill, and the Senior Resident Superior Court Judge, Honorable Alan Thornburg. Uh, there's Lisa's pointing to somebody that I forgot, and I can't read. Who? Chief Hooper. Oh, and Asheville Police Department Chief, uh, Tammy Hooper. Did I, did I leave out anyone? Well, thank you very much uh, for taking the time. So just to sort of lay the foundation of what we've been looking at in the safety net and what's been happening in the community. Uh, last year at Mission, there were 399 babies born with a positive toxicology uh, and uh, go going to go through withdrawal. And uh, as a result of their, their mother uh, being addicted to substances. In Buncombe County alone last year, there were 17 million painkillers prescribed, opioids prescribed in Buncombe County, just in Buncombe County. Based on the data that we have from our vital records department, we had 58 confirmed drug-related deaths in Buncombe County last year. There's still about uh, 103 that are still pending a final toxicology result that we don't know. Uh, we do believe that some of those may even be underreported in the 58. And Perhaps one of the statistics that shows a continuing problem in the community, the first responders, Buncombe County EMS responded to 1,270 overdose calls from January 1 through May of this year. And uh, continue, as you, as you see, the, the huge problem that's happening uh, in, in our county and in our region and in the, in across the state. Uh, just as some challenges, and these are things that we've talked about within our safety net coalition, but there's certainly challenges that are related to the providers in the community and how uh, they address the, the chronic needs. That's both from a physical standpoint and from a mental health standpoint. Uh, the individuals, just their ability to seek services if they're ready to engage in treatment. Uh, the impact that it has on our infrastructure, both uh, in our courts and in our jails impact that it has on first responders as our first responders are the oftentimes uh, the point of contact and having to go through that process uh, of the tragedy of overdoses and the impact that that has on them and then finally what we're seeing within our school systems and the impact particularly as we address some areas within school health uh, on what's happening with our children and both from a <coughs> prevention standpoint and from just a, a perspective of their, of their medical needs as well. Also, I'd like to recognize Commissioner Al Whitesides coming in. Thank you for being here today. So uh, as, as 
you see here, our North Carolina Attor Attorney General Josh Stein is here, and uh, he has gone across the state uh, listening to the communities that he's uh, across North Carolina to see what the impact has been and really wants to engage with, with us in understanding what the problem is that as we see it from our perspective and uh, trying to see what might be some things, some s potential solutions that we might be able to offer. We have a large room. We have until 1.30. Uh, certainly, if you want to stay after 1.30, that's perfectly okay. But to be mindful of every, every, everyone's time, uh, if you do have comments, that would be great if you have the opportunity to condense those, especially within the uh, area in which you work. Uh, just as a as a show of hands, could you, if you're, if you are a first responder, could you raise your hand so that we know who you are? That would be Asheville Fire or Fire Department, EMS, law enforcement. If you are a medical provider, could you raise your hand? If you're from a medical provider community, if you are an educator or a, a, another medical provider or in the behavioral health world, could you raise your hand from that? And I know we have at least one pharmacist. We have two pharmacists here from the three pharmacists here. Yeah, great. Okay. Well, Attorney General Stein, thank you so much for being here, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. <coughs> I am so appreciative that you all uh, are taking your time out to be with me and share the experiences that you are having here in Buncombe County. Uh, always a pleasure to see my good friend, Sheriff Duncan. Thank you very much for being here. Um, this problem, it's intense here in Buncombe County, as you all well know, but it is all over the state. It's in the mountains, it's in the Piedmont, and it's on the coast. There, there's one study that identified four cities with the greatest intensity of this problem in, in 2016, and four of those cities were in North Carolina. Uh, two were in the east, one was in the Piedmont, one was in the foothills, so it's, it is everywhere. And as I travel the state, talk about this issue and meet people, uh, invariably somebody will come up to me afterwards and, and share their personal story that either happened to them or their child or their child's best friend or um, their loved one. And you all know the stories, like the young boy uh, from Cary High School who was a star wrestler and injured his shoulder wrestling and got prescribed painkillers. and not too long after that was on heroin and then just a few years later died of an overdose or the guy who injures his back on the job and gets prescribed painkillers and, and gets hooked and loses his job, loses his family, loses control of his life. The teenage girl who parties on the weekend gets into the medicine cabinet of her parents and gets hooked, hooked on heroin, stole from her parents $80,000 in one year to feed her habit. The, I met a young guy in Greenville who, when he was 12, his mother had had knee surgery, got prescribed a ton of pills that went in the medicine cabinet. And as a teenage boy, he started messing around with those pills and got hooked. By the time he was 15, he was on heroin. By the time he was 18, he was homeless, living in a Walmart parking lot. But by the internal drive of himself, by the grace of God, that young man went through detox, through treatment, is now in recovery, studying at Pitt Community College to be a social worker because he wants to make sure that other teenage kids don't have to live through the hell that he experienced. And there are tens of thousands of stories not too different from that in North Carolina. Uh, and sadly, as you all well know, not all of them have that same inspiring, hopeful, optimistic result and result as this young man in Greenville. And it's what drives us all to address this crisis. Uh, four people die a day in North Carolina from drug overdose. It's now the number one cause of accidental death in our state, more than car crashes. It's the first time in decades that car crashes is the number one source of death. Um, if you look at deaths from prescription pills over the last seven or eight years, it's fairly static at around 500. But there's an absolute spike over the last three or four years of heroin and fentanyl deaths uh, as people start moving from prescription pills to heroin. And then the heroin that they buy on the street is laced with fentanyl because it's so cheap. It's a chemical analog of heroin. 
uh, and insanely potent. Just a size of a grain of salt of fentanyl is enough to kill a person. And they're being mixed by garage chemists who don't know what they're doing and one dose won't have any and then the next dose will have enough to kill somebody. And that's why deaths are spiking and it's spiking in North Carolina, it's spiking all over the country. New York Times just had a piece yesterday online that there was a 19% increase from 15 to 16 in opioid deaths, it, it, unprecedented in American history, that at such a high baseline of 50 some thousand people that there was that percentage increase in a single year. And so we expect 2017 tragically to be even deadlier than 2016, which was clearly deadlier than 15. In Buncombe County, we saw the stat about babies. <clears throat> 400 babies born at, at Mission Hospital last year suffered from drug withdrawal, which means that they don't sleep for two weeks. They're undernourished. They're screaming high-pitched wailing for days on end. That was 10% of all births at that hospital. One out of 10 babies was born suffering drug withdrawal. It was a 100% increase from 2015, 200 to 400. So we have a crisis on our hand, hands, and what I'm convinced of is we will not turn this around overnight. It's taken us about 20 years to get to the stage of crisis. We know we're on a terrible trajectory, but we can absolutely turn the tide on this crisis and we can save lives. The important thing is to do exactly what you all are doing here in Buckham County, which is to get law enforcement at the table with medical prescribers, at the table with substance use behavioral health people, with survivors themselves and with your local policymakers who can hear and put into action the ideas that y'all generate. At the state level, to me, the, the, the successful strategy hinges on prevention, treatment, and enforcement because you got to try to reduce the number of people who get addicted in the first place. You do that through working with prescribers so that they change their prescribing practices and with young people and families to try to address the risk-seeking behavior that leads too many people to mess around with the prescription pills. Uh, <coughs> last year in North Carolina, there were 700 mil million pills prescribed, 10 million prescriptions. That's enough for every person in the state of North Carolina to have gotten a prescription for opioid. And Buncombe County had one of the highest densities in terms of pills per capita of any county in the state. So there's just a ton of pills, and pills are dangerous for two reasons. One is it can create addicts in people. Uh, I was just reading a story about a young girl at the um, uh, Black Mountain facility. She was a soccer player, knee surgery. Her doctor prescribed her six months worth of Percocets. Ten years later, she's a heroin addict living in a public safety facility. So we're prescribing too much. And when even when people aren't, they don't use all those pills, they put them in the medicine cabinet. And those pills just become a magnet to people with addiction and to young people looking to make bad decisions. So we've got to reduce the number of pills. Uh, treatment, there are tens of thousands of North Carolinians living with substance use disorder of one form or another. And opioids are becoming an increasing share of that problem. And yet, last year in our state, one out of 10 people got any type of treatment. Just let that sink in. Only one out of 10 sick people got any kind of treatment. Would we accept a health care system in which 90% of people with heart disease or 90% of people with diabetes don't get the health care they need to get healthy? And yet, that is the system we have here in the United States and here in North Carolina. I just came from touring uh, Montford Hall uh, right before I got here. If y'all haven't been to that facility, it's just beautiful, remarkable, uh, an incredible facility that you're fortunate to have here. Uh, houses like 20 teenage boys uh, for upwards of a year to give them the intense wraparound services that they need to get out what is the underlying trauma, how do you come up with skills to avoid taking drugs, how do you deal with whatever issues you have, um, and how do you get educated so you can advance your, your schooling and fortunately have a, a, a positive, productive life. But that's 20 slots. They said that nationwide there are 150 equivalent beds for teenage boys for intensive extended treatment, 150. It is an utter drop in the ocean, and yet we 
as citizens, we as residents of Buncombe County, we as residents of North Carolina, we as residents of the United States tolerate that. I think that's something we need to address. And then of course, enforcement. There are drug traffickers out there making millions and millions of dollars off of people's addiction, off of death and misery, and they need to be held severely accountable for the damage that they wreak. Uh, but there's a difference between somebody who's out there pushing these drugs, making profit off of these drugs, and somebody who is addicted. And their crime is their sickness. Um, that doesn't tolerate using illegal substances or uh, violating the law, but we have to ask ourselves, what's the best solution for that person? And as I talk to law enforcement all across the state, what I hear over and over again is that we will not arrest our way out of this crisis. That we can't just put people in jail and expect them to come out and not go back to the behavior or, or patterns that they were in because they haven't gotten the treatment and they haven't learned uh, how to live a different life where they can avoid those, uh, those problems. So there are a lot of innovative programs going on around the state is what I'm discovering in terms of diverting people as they engage the criminal justice system, diverting them to other forms of uh, relief treatment so that they can get healthy and they don't live off the taxpayer dime in, in prison, which is usually about four or five times more expensive than treatment costs. Um, so I know that you all are doing a lot here in Buncombe County. There's this group, the Safety Net Coalition. I, I read about the Western North Carolina Substance Use Alliance. Uh, I know that the county was debating community paramedics. I know that y'all are working on diversion programs. You are embracing harm reduction strategies, uh, all of which is to the good. And I very much hope that we can engage and hear from you all about the different things that you're experimenting with, the different things that you think are working, those that aren't working, where the big gaps are. I mean, basically, we're on, we're on, I, I, this image just came into my head. There was a Denzel Washington movie about a train that was out of control and cra getting ready to crash. He has to fix the train at the same time it's going 60 miles an hour down the track. And that's what we've got now. We don't know what's going to work, so we're having to fix things on the fly. Um, so we will not address it solely at the state level. We've got important legislation that we're pushing. There's the STOP Act to deal with prescribing practices. Uh, it sets limits on the number of pills for acute pain. Uh, it requires use of the Controlled Substance Reporting Service database so that there can't be doctor shopping, e-prescribing to deal with prescription pad for, for forgeries and fraud. We've got a Synthetic Opioid Control Act, which will close loopholes as it relates to some of these fentanyl drugs, which are killing people but are not illegal in North Carolina. So we need to close those loopholes. But uh, we won't fix this problem until we deal with it at the local level. And so that's what I'm here to, to learn from you all today. And very much appreciate you all taking the time. I'd like to take an opportunity now if you, any of you have some specific uh, questions or some specific comments. I have a quick question. Um, it would be really helpful if you would say your name and who you work with, what kind of work yeah. you do, just for uh, everybody's benefit. I'm Scott Parker from Western North Carolina Community Health Services. We're a federally qualified community health center here in Nashville. Um, it seems to me that this is really going to take a federal response. And I wanted to get your opinion, given the current, current political climate and a bit of paralysis in Washington, do you see any hope of a federal response? Well, this is a, an interesting issue because um, when you just talk about opioids and you talk about this <clears throat> epidemic, it actually has been very, fairly nonpartisan, and that's at the state level and the federal level. The, the STOP Act, you know, I'm working with Senator Jim Davis from Western North Carolina. I'm working with um, all the representatives and, and senators are Republican. They feel this issue intensely and passionately and want to address it. Similarly, in Washington, one of the last acts of last year was the Cures Act, where they put up billions, I think it was $3 billion nationally, for this issue. Uh, 31 million of which just got awarded to North Carolina to provide treatment. So that is all to the good. But then you have what they want to do to Medicaid and eliminating the Affordable Care Act, 
which the Affordable Care Act is the single biggest program we have dealing with substance use disorder treatment in the country's history. It's that insurance that is provided. And when you cut 20 million people off of health care, that's 20 million people who no longer have health insurance to pay for whatever services you all provide. So it's this sort of recognition on that specific issue, but then on a macro level, they're taking two steps backwards. And so I think it's important that we inform our representatives and the, and the people who elect the representatives about the consequences of the policy decisions they're doing. Similarly, here in Raleigh, if we had just expanded Medicaid, that would have been a half million more people who had health insurance who could actually get the treatment that they need paid for by insurance rather than trying to find some free, free service, which is few and far between. Attorney General, my name is Michael Harney. I've been in this town since 1992, and I helped to co-coordinate and co-found what's known as the Needle Exchange Program of Asheville. In 1994, working in this wonderful community, if we ever exchanged 1,000 needles in a year, we thought we were doing this amazing work. In 2015, we went through 239,000 needles. In 2016, we provided access to 512,000 needles. People who came to the Western North Carolina AIDS Project office where we're operating from represented 32 different counties and came from four different states. It is my thought, and it's always been my wish, that of the 100 counties we have here in North Carolina, that all county health departments be at least one certain location. I know that most county health departments offer vaccines and immunizations and condoms and you know whatever else they do, I was hoping that all county health departments could be one safe, unstigmatizing, no discrimination locations for people to access clean needles, have access to you know, potentially a nurse, and then to fully fund ADAX across the state. To cut ADAX is so long at this time, as you say, we're going down the line with a 10% cut potentially in the ADAC here in Black Mountain, talking about a million four hundred thousand dollar loss in a time that we really need more treatment. Glad to meet you and thank you for being here. Thanks for those comments. Yeah, needle exchanges, have, <laughs> this will sound funny. Needle exchanges have come a long way in North Carolina. <laughs> um, it's, they're now legal. I mean, when you first were operating, you were doing it because you thought it was right, but it, there wasn't legal authority for you to do it. And now there's an entire statutory scheme. And this was a law, by the way, uh, introduced and pushed, passed and signed by Republicans. So. There has been real change in the way that people are looking at public health issues um, and, and the growth of hepatitis C and AIDS obviously is a great part of this. But what needle exchanges have been shown to do is a person who, a, a, a user who participates in a needle exchange is five times more likely to pursue treatment than somebody who isn't engaged in a needle exchange. And so the way that needle exchange work is it just gets them in a relationship with somebody and open to hearing from somebody, hey, here's something that's available to you. When you're ready for this, here's some treatment options. And so uh, it has great long-term uh, savings to the healthcare system, to the public safety system, to everything. There are, and there's actual legal immunity for people who participate in a legal, the, a legal um, needle exchange program. Um, and there are some law enforcement around the state that just, they hadn't shifted their mind yet. They don't quite understand that the, that the legal terrain has changed under them. And we've heard actually some people being arrested for drug paraphernalia when they are a uh, legitimate registered user of a needle exchange program. So uh, you've been at this work a long time, but for us policymakers, it's a new experience for us. And uh, hopefully we'll continue to uh, learn and grow and come up with innovative solutions to deal with public health crisis like this. Dr. Fagan. I'm Jerry Behan. I'm the Emergency Services Director for Buncombe County, and I've got two or three concerns, and one of them you touched on was community paramedics. And we've been looking at that here in Buncombe County. Quite frankly, the problem is it's going to cost $300,000 to, to put it in, in place. The state has a grant program, kind of a pilot program, but I'd like to see that spread for every county. 
And where I think this could come in handy here, for example, dealing with, with the drug problem, we can do a lot of follow-up. And we don't look, if we institute that program here in Buncombe, we don't look at it as saving just Buncombe County money. It's going to save Mission Hospital money. It's going to save law enforcement money, and everybody has to respond. Right now, when we have an overdose and we're averaging two a day or more, sometimes as many as five, uh, and we can usually tell when somebody's got a lot different dosage of heroin that's come into this county. But uh, when you're looking at, at what's involved in this, the, the community paramedic program can do a lot of follow-up treatment, just the same as we would with what we refer to as frequent flyers or people who use ambulance a lot, uh, you know, to get some of this load off. Something else we're finding, some of the pushers out here also, when they're selling the drugs, they're giving them the Narcan. Mm -hmm. Narcan's a wonderful thing, but still, you know, you can, something's got to be done about that part of the problem also. If you're going to give them the treatment along with the drug, I don't know that that really works because they start pushing the envelope and then you end up with, with a number of deaths. But, Anyway, if there's anything that can be done on the state level, it's something we would certainly, uh, certainly appreciate it. And you know, these people, you look at them, and you've got to be out there, like law enforcement is. And I know Chief Hooper over here, particularly from the city, and, and the van from the county, they deal with this every day. And uh, you know, we're looking at it for what it is. And you've got the, the prescription medications out there, and you know, we just need some help, and something has to be done. I hear you and agree wholeheartedly. Um, Nash County has a community paramedic program that they just, uh, just got up and running. Wake is about to start one, and the way they're doing it is they're in partnership with, um, I forget the name of Donald McDonald's group. What, what, Steve, what, Covering Communities in North Carolina. We're covering Communities in North Carolina. By the way, that's Steve Mange, who's my policy director and the point person in our office for this crisis. So he's a really great resource for you all if you have follow-up questions and, and can't find me for whatever reason. But they are partnering with this nonprofit group, with most of whom have been through recovery themselves. They're doing peer-to-peer -peer counseling. So it, they don't have to hire as many community paramedics. They act, whenever a community paramedic goes out, they go out with one or two of these volunteers. Now, it isn't an ideal solution, but it extends the reach and gets the program up and running. Um, New Hanover County, Wilmington, they actually have in the budget a $250,000 pilot program appropriation. And so I think that uh, that's the kind of thing that if it gets up and running and proves its value, then maybe we can come up with some state grants. But I, I very much urge you all not to wait on the state to develop your own innovations, e even if it requires financial money. Because just as you said, the problem is, is the expense comes out of one account, the county's account. But the cost, there are plenty of costs to the county in terms of EMS, ambulance services, the jail, you know, van having to deal with these folks. And but then the hospital has to deal with ER visits and hospitalizations, much of which may be uninsured. So to me, there's no question, but the costs outweigh, the benefits of reducing those costs outweigh the costs of the community paramedics. It's just those benefits are diffuse and it doesn't come out of the same account. So sometimes it's harder to get people to pay up and maybe you get into a partnership with Mission Hospital where they, I'll spend Mission Hospital's money. Maybe they chip in, <laughs> chip in some money too. On behalf of mission, we thank you. For that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good at that. I'm good at that. Uh, Jasmine Beach Farrar from County Commission. Um, beyond the community paramedic model, are there programs or strategies that you've seen having a particular impact either in other North Carolina communities or other communities around the country? Well, we are in the process of sort of aggregating all of these ideas and lessons. We're going to put together a resource manual where we just describe various initiatives that various communities are dealing with and giving contact information for that local community so that we sort of take our us out of it so you can just call up the person in Nash County who had ZMS and say how is a small poor rural county financing this how are you doing that and then get some ideas and that way um, definitely on the law enforcement side also in Nash County the police chief of Nashville has a program uh, that they've called the HOPE Initiative, 
which is basically anyone who walks through the door can turn in their paraphernalia and their drugs and there will be no charges. And the police chief will then take that person, connect that person with treatment. Sometimes has to connect them with something in Florida or in New Hampshire. He can't always find one within the region. But basically the mission of that police department is if you want to get help, we will move mountains to get you that help. And they have had like 130 people, teeny little town of Nashville, um, in one year come through the door. Fayetteville has a similar but not exactly the same program called Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion LEAD, where uh, the local law enforcement officers are, are empowered as they are out in the community. They know who are regular users. They know who cycle through the criminal justice system. And they have criteria whereby if the person they engage meets that criteria, they say, look, I won't make an arrest. I'll hold this arrest in abeyance. And you do these things, which it's a very similar model to drug treatment courts. I don't know what Buncombe County's status is, Judge, whether there's a drug treatment court here. There used to be 40 or so statewide. Now it's down to 28 because the state stopped funding them. But it's the same model. It's but it's pre-arrest, whereas drug treatment court, you're arrested and then the charges are held in abeyance. Here, the arrest is held in abeyance. And so it's a, it's a different model. It comes from Seattle and Santa Fe, but Waynesville's uh, getting ready to experiment with it. Statesville is, uh, Gastonia is. Basically, like I said, communities are learning on the fly. But we'll have a resource manual that we can share whenever it's ready. Judge. In terms of the, the question was about what courts are doing about this. I think that where the drug treatment courts are in operation, where the counties took over full uh, payment of them, they're going just as you would hope they would, where you have specialized prosecutors who understand this issue. You have a judge who understands this issue. And the prosecutors and the judge are constantly looking for ways to find the appropriate treatment for this person so they come up with the terms of it. Uh, oftentimes it's outpatient, but you have to go to daily or weekly uh, peer support <coughs> programs. You need to get tested, drug tested regularly. You appear before the judge on a monthly basis. And if you meet the terms, then at the end of the year, the judge will drop the charges. So I think that model works very well. It's just it's not widely implemented in North Carolina. The There are other judges where <coughs> That, that it's not formally a drug treatment court, but that's what they do all day. So they end up just doing it themselves, just not in a formalized structure. I'm, I'm familiar with the role of the treatment courts, and we do have one or two active in Bunker County. Okay. But the volume of these opioid incidents is so large. How are you seeing courts address people who don't get into these drug courts? And... and, and I, I did a, a round table in Jacksonville, which was Camp Lejeune, which was one of the four cities with the greatest intensity of this problem. They don't have a drug treatment facility in the entire county of Onslow County. So just imagine, so if you have a sympathetic prosecutor, if you have a sympathetic judge, you don't have anywhere to put that person other than the jail. And so what ends up happening is that the jails become the leading treatment facility in the state of North Carolina. And I, I'll be interested to hear your experience, Van, but there are different counties that are trying to come up with different uh, initiatives to uh, identify people in jail and connect them with treatment. There, there was a couple guys I met in Gastonia who were at a residential treatment facility um, who were still serving their jail time, but they were doing it in the facility because the uh, sheriff and his folks, the jailers, had determined these people were suitable for the program. Again, that's all contingent on there being a bed for those guys to go to. And I'm quite sure that there were more people who met the criteria than there were places for them to go. So I think until we address treatment and the scarcity of treatment, we're spinning our wheels at one level. Uh, Eric Christian with Community Care of Western North Carolina. Um, you know, we all go to sort of prevention and awareness and know we need to do that at the same time as we address current issues and 
Thanks. Many of the uh, coalitions struggle with how to spend limited dollars that they may have, <coughs> grant funds, things like that. So it makes me think of economies of scale at the state level, and this is one place where you can be in the middle of it all because you have the ability to market across the state for awareness at all <coughs> levels. You know, marketing basically to or making awareness available to people at all stages, even people who may not know that the percent of taking is addictive all the way up to where do I, how do I get treatment? What's the number I can call for my loved one? Because we're doing it individually and spending a lot of money to try to get a billboard up and just blowing out mm -hmm. all the funds and yet we could do this more centrally. Mm -hmm. Other things can be more local and might and probably need to be, but that's the one item that always comes out. And I don't know if the new CARES funding, some of that will be dedicated towards it. I know a lot of it will be dedicated towards treatment, but I wonder if you can speak about that opportunity. There is. Um, the 80% of the CURES grant, the 33, 31 million, goes to prevention and treatment. I think it'll mainly be going to treatment, but they will definitely have a, a public education component. Um, I think that you make a good point. Uh, we deal with budget scarcity uh, at the state level too, and uh, I don't disagree with your point. It just means that we as state policy makers need to be advocating for the right type of resources. You know, part of the Stop Act when it was introduced was $20 million in treatment over two years, and it um, got dropped from the bill. Then it got it wasn't in the Senate budget, and it wasn't in the House budget. But then uh, Greg Murphy, a state representative from Greenville, who's a doctor and a champion for the Stop Act, he got uh, $10 million added back to the House budget over two years. But now that bill's in conference, so we have to push the Senate to make sure it funds community-based treatment and recovery services too. So I, I don't disagree with you. It's just a, a valid takeaway for me to have. Is this uh, something possible to follow up with uh, your colleague Steve? Absolutely. Thank you. Good. We, we do have an adult grocery report here, and I, I say that because we have our commissioners here and our sheriff, and they fund this entirely. Yep. Um, and it works well, and um, our numbers prove that. But um, we work with uh, surrounding counties such as Madison, and you know you can have the most willing uh, DA, public defender, or defense community judge. Everybody's on board, but they don't have the. It's difficult for a rural county to have the services. Um, so you know, a one size fits all approach is not necessarily going to work. I, I was interested to you mentioned Nash County, um, so we have to get creative about that. I think it would help for those counties that are running successful programs to be able to model how, what that looks like to these other counties mm -hmm. and to actually advocate on behalf of rural North Carolina to help them receive those services. We have treatment providers here. It's not perfect, but, but we are, um, we're blessed with that. But until the, the Charlottes and the Buckhams and the Wakes uh, you know, push for these rural counties, is not necessarily in their own self-interest. Um, it's going to be difficult. So I don't know what that mechanism would look like, but there was some way we could come together on a statewide basis and do that. It, it might be helpful. I agree with you. The way I look at it is very similar to the way the state has always funded public education, which is the state has been the predominant source of public education dollars so that every county, you know, 80 to 90 percent of your baseline is equal, and now some school systems will do their local add-on, just like I'm sure Asheville City and Buckham County schools do, but at least it gives a kid in Gates County a, a fighting shot. Like a lot of northern states, it's 90 percent locally funded. Like the state just doesn't put in much money, and if you live in a poor county, you're guaranteed to go to a poor school, um, and I think that treatment is a perfect example of that and drug treatment courts are a perfect example of that is, is why the state should bear a bigger load and that way the successful urban city c communities which are chipping in a disproportionate share of revenue to the state are spreading that those resources to areas of the state where they can't generate it themselves uh, so i agree with you hi i'm lynn dressler from mission health personalized medicine program and i again for being here um, just the other day i Um, 
Um, there were three things that came out of at least my reading of it that I just wanted to ask your um, response or others' response. Um, one is that one of the primary care groups in the region, because there were so many overdoses, were actually teaching community members, like you would do CPR, how to do some of the nasal sprays as a way to help save lives. Another one was that a volunteer group Um, I, I haven't been to West Virginia, but when you look at this crisis nationally, West Virginia, Ohio, particularly Eastern Ohio, New Hampshire, uh, and Eastern Tennessee, that, 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 that's the epicenter. That, that's where, I mean, the death rates are three times what we have here in North Carolina. And what we don't want to have is North Carolina. We're on the trajectory. We're essentially eight years behind those states. And what we don't want to do is eight years from now be where those states are. Um, and that's why we're, we're trying to get ahead of it. And when you look at the STOP Act and the limit on the number of pills that are prescribed and the e-prescribing and the mandatory use of this database, these are ideas that we scoured the country and found out what are the other states in crisis doing to deal with it. And that's why we brought those ideas here to North Carolina. Um, so we. This is a topic that comes up when I go to national meetings with attorneys general. Uh, we are exchanging ideas, but uh, I mean, I like the idea of the school. I, I think that the public, the prison system, and we, we are actually reducing the prison population and we've closed a couple of prisons. I think having more of the prisons dedicated to treatment the way that Black Mountain is um, makes a lot of sense. I've heard, I don't know what the experience is here, Sheriff, but so, some sheriffs have told me that 75 to 80% of the men in the county jail are there either because of drugs or uh, property crime because of drugs, that they're trying to feed their habit. And that upwards of 100% of the women are there because of substance use. And so I think that using, uh, it requires resources. We just have to ask ourselves, how do we want to spend the resources that we have uh, to help people? Blake Fagan with uh, Mayhem Family Physician. And I am for the, uh, the STOP Act and trying to limit uh, acute opioids prescriptions in five days or less. I think that's great. We have to try to get the number of pills that are in our community, but actually in our medicine cabinets to be less. Um, I'd like to put a proposal out there that at um, follow up from a surgery that you actually bring in your unused opiates and you turn them in. Right now, um, I have a patient that comes in and hands me their bottle. If I take it, I'm pretty sure I'm in trouble. Um, and I'm not allowed to do that. So we need to, we need to work on that because I think if, if we got that out of the community and you know that you just, when you show up at your first post-op visit, you, you show up with the meds that you didn't use, we could really help to reduce the amount in the cabinets. I'm pretty sure there's a DEA regulation, Steve. Yeah, unfortunately, you can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> you would have to, uh, actually, you could do it, but the, reg the DEA regulations for becoming a reverse distributor of controlled substances are so unbelievably onerous that you would not want to do that. Yeah. I'm pretty sure the orthopedic surgeons aren't going to do it. Now. So, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, could I other, other take back options, maybe. Yeah, that was sort of a follow-up to um, Stephanie Kaiser and with the UNC Ashland School of Pharmacy and I have several other colleagues here with me that we just last week convened a small group of community pharmacists just to talk about this because what we recognized is we would go to a lot of meetings and we'd look around the room and we'd say well we're here but we're not community pharmacists and 
So I highly encourage your office to find ways, and we might have ways to suggest, to really bring community pharmacists to the table, and it won't be middle of the day, because they're all working. Um, but we, we had a lot of conversation about how do you increase the number of legally supported drop boxes. But suffice it to say, we have them, but they're in the walls of sheriff's departments. And that isn't the most friendly place for many folks to bring their medications to get rid of them. Um, they are in some pharmacies, but they are just a handful in the state of North Carolina. And if you look across state lines into other states, there are more states that have engaged pharmacists and pharmacies in that work. Again, we've got to get over the hurdles of the DEA requirements, but that's something the Attorney, Gen Attorney General's office, probably in collaboration with our Board of Pharmacy, could help do. Like, bust the myths, here's how you do it, here's how it's supported, you know, give the user guide. Let's do it. <laughs> we, th there's a um, <laughs> program in North Carolina called Operation Medicine Drop, and it's done through the insurance, Department of Insurance in conjunction with us, and we promote it and there are a number of, every county in the state now has a permanent drop box and uh, Sheriff you've got one and and, 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 the and, police, and Sheriff you have one two yeah and, but to your point people's first instinct didn't go to the police department uh, there are pharmacies everywhere Walgreens is doing a little bit I want to give them some credit I did a on national drug take back day which was the end of April I went to one in Apex, and they have a permanent one. It looks just like a mailbox, and it's right beside the pharmacy counter. Um, and how, how many do they have in North Carolina, Steve? Do you know? It's on the border between 20 and 25 statewide. Yeah, and so that's a drop in the bucket, but it's a start. Uh, so we, we are doing that. We've been working with CVS and Walgreens because that's 85%, but the community pharmacists are actually probably doing it at a higher rate. So Steve and I will follow up uh, with the Board of Pharmacy in that regard. I think that that's a solution that what I hope over time will become less necessary because doctors won't be over prescribing. I mean, I went in for a minor procedure, came away with 30 days of pills. I mean, it's just, I needed, I didn't need one. I didn't ever take a single one. So I have this big uh, thing of pills in my, my house. So. We just need to stop the overprescribing on the front end, but we also need more drop boxes, so I agree with you. Chair. We have been doing the uh, drop boxes and the community take backs for a while, and we've done it through our uh, DFC sponsored, uh, CAG co sponsored Substance Free Youth Coalition. has done a lot of it. The problem with the DEA letter it requires law enforcement presence. That's one of the owner's parts that Steve was talking about. And if something, you know, uh, Roger Banks was talking about with uh, the community paramedics and the people who work out, not community paramedics, but your folks who work out in the community, if they could extend that to licensed uh, medical professionals like paramedics to do those take backs. And we've had a lot of success with Walgreens as well. I think a lot of this will require a change in federal law, and uh, Governor Cooper is on the President's National Opioid Task Force, and so he can take, we've been sharing ideas with him that need to happen at the federal level, and I think we'll underscore this issue about DEA regulations, because that's something hopefully the feds can uh, take off the straitjacket that's holding folks back from wanting to do good. I mean, there's a reason why the rule is there in the first place, right? Because it's very easy to divert. It's a he said, she said, oh, I brought back 60 of my pills. And then I said, oh, I got 60 pills. Let me kick in 20 and I'll sell 40. I mean, it, there are people who are driven by ill intent and ill motive. And so that's why the rules are there in the first place. We just need to figure out something that is looser than what we have, but doesn't create a, a, a big upsurge in the black market. So uh, Joe Belcher, I'm one of the county commissioners and just, uh, comment regarding the, um, the West Virginia the city that she's mentioning is my hometown so it's Welch West Virginia which is where I went to high school and so it gives me a certain perspective as a commissioner when we look at opioids and policies uh, policy makers at state federal level external uh, influences has affected poverty uh, to an incredible extent I mean, I go back to where I'm, I'm from, and it, I mean, if you've never been, you should go. 
it will enlighten you and open your eyes. But there's, there's so many people, they don't, they don't have an opportunity to get rid of the fields. So there's a weak moment, they sell the fields. And it goes on all the time. So um, crazy idea on drop boxes, library drop boxes. I mean, I'll be able to drop box anywhere. Mm -hmm. Anywhere to be able to get rid of the pills because when someone is driven to a state of poverty and it's deep enough and dark enough, then uh, scripture, that Paul said that, but for the grace of God, there go I. You don't know what you'll do when you get in the deepest, darkest moment when you think you're trying to take care of your family. So in Buncombe County, one of the things we want to try to avoid is to, is to, is to, Bring those people out of poverty. And I know this extends beyond that, but we've got to watch that, be careful with that, and we've got to remove the, that opportunity where they, they can't bring those pills to us. And that moment clicks when, oh, I can sell because I have this need. We've got to be very careful with that and watch that. And at the state and federal level, we just need to keep, uh, we need to pay attention to the jobs, pay attention to those opportunities, make sure we open them up and make sure that as policymakers, we don't leave those people. Um, pretty easy for me to move, but my heart's never left there, so the thought process goes back. The other thing they did, and I don't, not necessarily saying that we should do this, they just, one of the cities sued the, the pharmaceutical. I mean, they're just trying to hold whoever they can accountable for the, the, the dark problem that they're in. But thank you for coming today. Thank you. And, and our office is looking at issues around liability and seeing whether there are uh, companies that engaged in deceptive or unfair acts that help to create this crisis. I mean, it's a very complicated set of factors that got us to this point, uh, and there's a lot of blame to go around. Uh, the key is we're in this terrible point today. What can we do to try to turn it, turn it around? I'm going to speak right here. I'm Tammy Schick, Social Work Director for Beckham County Health and Human Services, and I just want to bring light to a, the, the smallest population that this impacts, and it's the children. Um, and so um, in Beckham County, we have 327 children in foster care today, and of that number, over half are under the age of five. Um, and most of those children actually entered care between the ages of uh, newborn and two. Over 60% of those children entered care specifically because of substance abuse issues, mainly with their mother. And I just want to bring to light that subpopulation of perinatal substance use disorder and how that impacts not just that child, but um, that mom, the lack of resources that we have for um, prenatal and postpartum uh, folks who are engaged in substance use disorder um, addiction. And to really talk about uh, medication-assisted treatment and what that option is and offers for these moms to destigmatize some of that um, and to try to collaborate uh, in a greater way to make sure that they're offered every opportunity at the point of the ED or wherever they're encountered to be able to engage in services that keep them healthy and therefore the baby healthier. We are doing a lot in this area, and I'm not going to take time to go through that, but you mentioned the Alliance. I'm on a sub-subgroup of the Alliance, and so we're working really hard together to address this and be happy to share that information, including a partnership with Mission where we have an embedded um, Child Protective Services social worker on the mother-baby unit. That's how many cases of this that we respond to. She is employed full-time by us that is housed on the mother-baby unit at Mission to respond to these cases. So anything you can do um, or suggest for us, we're open to that. It sounds like y'all are doing a wonderful thing. If you can give your contact information to Steve, that would be very helpful. Um, the foster care is just one of many, many, many <coughs> ancillary costs that society is having to pay from this crisis. And the foster care is going up all over the state, the number of children, and, and there are not, there are many more times the number of children than there are families prepared to, to take them and um, terribly tragic. Mr. Stein, the, the, the problem with behavioral health here and also physical health being combined, I can see a train wreck coming because behavioral health don't know physical, physical don't know behavior. And I think that is going to be a serious issue when the MCOs that are not getting funded like they should be their services getting cut everywhere. So when you 
tried to divert the behavioral into the physical, uh, you've got a really problem. And I think it's going to escalate what you're trying to do. And funding is going to be the key thing. Substance abuse has never been funded. And uh, it's always been talked about, least talked about, or more talked about the least funded. So if you don't get the funding, you can get all this nice work. So work on the funding. That's all I think I can Thank you. We are at time. Uh, if there's anyone that has a question that needs to be asked, I want to make sure that we have one more time to make sure we ask that question. I also want to take an opportunity to recognize a couple more people that were here. Our uh, Buncombe County Commission Chair, Brownie Newman, is here. And Asheville Mayor Esther Manheimer is here. And our District Attorney, Todd Williams, was here. He has a baby. He had to go home. He had to go home to the baby. <laughs> Thank you very much for taking the time to meet with us and to, and to hear and for us to hear from you. It was very helpful. Uh, we would love to be able to stay engaged with you in your office and keep uh, the dialogue open, certainly from the pharmacy perspective and what Tammy was saying with social work and certainly from other providers. Uh, we welcome that opportunity and thank you so much for being here today. And thank you all for coming. And just a reminder, for we will not meet, if, in case you're coming, looking forward to the next Safety Net Coalition meeting, not meet in July. We will meet in August. And Lynn Dressler will actually be here to talk about genetic, uh, the Fullerton Genetic Center, and to talk about uh, the linkage or not between uh, genetics and addiction. So we look forward to uh, that meeting next August. Thank you very much for coming.